today's episode of Still To Be Determined. We're going to be talking about heat pumps, basically home building questions from the mailbag, and some other topics. As usual, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids, including the most recently released book in my library, The Sinister Secrets of Sin, which is out now. With me, as always, is my brother, Matt. He's that Matt from Undecided with Matt Farrell, which take a, takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. And speaking of tech, I'm in like tech hell. I've been setting up my smart home and mm-hmm. it uh, completely and it's blew stupid. up on me. It, it's very stupid. It, mm. it completely fell apart and I'm having to reset it all up again. <laughs> Technology has failed me. How are you doing? That will, I won't go into details yet on uh, what I will be sharing, but that subject of the difficulty of a smart home is actually a comment in the mailbag. So we'll be talking oh, about okay. that a little bit more. Uh, but I'm doing okay. It was a kind of wild and woolly weekend for me. Uh, we had another pretty heavy storm come through New York City, not as bad as the week previous where there was footage that was being shared nationally um, with three feet of water on Fourth Avenue in yeah. Brooklyn and, yep. and, and and all of that. Um, but I had a book festival event I had to go to. And every book festival I have ever been a part of, it has rained. And <laughs> this one was no different. But this it's one, fault. yeah, it's something <laughs> about this rain cloud that follows me around. I'm not sure if it's directly related, but I ended up taking New Jersey transit, uh, into a Northern town of Glen Rock in New Jersey. And they have a small book festival there that's been organized by a great books shop called the curious reader. So if any of our listeners or viewers are in the Northern New Jersey area, I highly recommend the curious reader. It's a terrific bookshop and they have this book festival, which is a couple dozen, I think probably authors and illustrators. So it's not enormous, but the turnout was tremendous. Despite the fact it was torrential downpour for (laughs) portions of it. The winds were incredible. There were tents set up in order to give protection to the visitors when they were not in the author tents or in the tent buying their books. Um, There were tents set up just for them to be able to be out of the rain. Uh, One of those tents started to blow away at one point, uh, flipped over (laughs) completely. So they had some of the volunteers during the windiest parts of the storm were actually tasked with standing in a tent, just holding it in place. Uh, So, and the largest (laughs) tent to blow over was actually the one with the book registers. Um, It was a large red tent situated between the two author tents. And when it flipped over, I (laughs) thought, well, this is the beginning of the end. This this does not bode well. We carried on. The tents were put back into place and reweighted and and everything continued. Uh, So despite the weather and apparently last year's event, it was very similar. A hurricane literally came through, Um, but they still had their, their festival. So... They had it this year as well. Again, another major storm, but made it through. Not one author, illustrator, or book was damaged despite this. It was really pretty remarkable. And like I said, the turnout was incredible. Um, I've never been to a book festival where I've signed as many books as I did at this one. So wow, I was like very impressed by how supportive the community is of kids' literature, readership, tons of teachers, librarians, and so many kids. And the kids were fantastic. The kids would come running up and want to find out more about our books and we would share information. And it was really uh, very heartwarming to see the responses from kids as they would run from table to table with excitement. Um, And then the inevitable conflict of they'd been told they could pick out one or two books, but they wanted them all. So (laughs) <laughs> it was a, it was a fun day, but it was yeah. uh, a tiring day. So it was a full day for me of heading out from Brooklyn, getting on the trains, heading up to Jersey and then coming back. And by the time I got back, I felt like I had been gone for three days. So 
<laughs> just in time to record a podcast. <laughs> just in time to record a podcast. I had a full day of recovery uh, yesterday, though. So uh, Matt and I are doing this on an atypical recording day, partly for him, partly for me. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know what Matt had to recover from, maybe from trying to get his smart home up and working. <laughs> Before we get into our conversation about Matt's most recent episode, I wanted to share some comments from previous ones. We had some people weighing in on subjects not quite tied in specifically to the subject of the videos, but that's fine. We love having we love having any kind of feedback. And if you have comments or questions and it doesn't tie in directly to an episode, continue to drop them in. Drop them in. It's it's terrific. We had in our conversation, episode 186, in which we discussed NASA and its 3D printing tech, there were some notably non-NASA comments like this one from Andrew Knotts, who jumped in to say, I am just installing a solar edge inverter with a grid isolator that can run the house in the event of grid failure. This is a new product that I've been waiting a year for. I wanted mm -hmm. to know your thoughts, Matt, about this kind of tech and how useful it would be for just an average homeowner, like, uh, the commenter or yourself building a new home, putting something together, you've got solar panels. Is this kind of inverter useful, uh, oh, yeah. for the general populace? Oh yeah. Uh, like right now batteries are still on the expensive side. So most people don't get batteries installed when they get solar. And then they complain that when the grid goes down, their solar panels don't work and they get very frustrated. This is the answer to that question. It's not just solar edge, but end phase, the company I'm using that makes micro inverters has a similar product so that when the grid goes down, you can, and you're producing solar, you can at least still be using some level of power while the grid is down. Of course, in the evening you lose everything because there's no sun at night but it at least gives you something during the day that you can still get some kind of power out of it. These, it's a huge game changer. It's a, it's about, it's one of those, it's about time that they put this kind of stuff on the market because it's, it's going to be huge. Mm -hmm. I would also think that given, and I just talked about the storm that impacted my travels this weekend, we are very obviously in a new era of what weather impact looks like. And yep. we, should anticipate more grid failure than grid sustainability. Um, so I would think that in the coming decade, having this kind of tech on your home is going to be life changing for people as we're going to have more events that are going to lead to grid failures and having a home where you're able to depend on at least a moderate amount of energy production so that your refrigerator continues to run or you're able yeah. to you're able to light your home or able to keep yourself in the event of maybe in the summer being able to actually run an air conditioning unit as opposed to sweltering in 100 degree heat uh, something like this is going to become very useful i would also like to point out matt i would love a t-shirt that would say what you had just said there is no sun at night <laughs> <laughs> with your name as the yeah. Matt Farrell. There's no sun October, at night. Matt October Farrell. 9th. Undecided with Matt Farrell. 2023. It's really going to get the viewership numbers going up. <laughs> and then this comment from Tecker, who is, this is the comment that I hinted at earlier in this episode. I watched Matt's new house video and was so lost by the tech I'm 62 and use a 2005 <laughs> tower computer and hate smartphones, but don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'd love to have solar panels and a flow battery backup. The problem is it has to be easy to use by low tech slash no tech people. Yes. So maybe this is a subject for an actual video for your channel. Yeah. Uh, but just very briefly, what's your response to the idea of this kind of user oh. looking for, <laughs> I need it to be dummy proof. I need to be able to yeah. go somewhere, plug it in and know it's doing its job. And, uh, I'm having flashbacks as we talk about this to practically every conversation we have with our parents about oh, yeah. things from Apple watches to Wi-Fi to computer usage. 
I'm having flashbacks to our grandmother claiming she didn't want a cordless phone, not a, not a cell phone, but a cordless phone because right. in her words, she didn't want to have to add extra outlets into her home. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is not new. This, no. there is a point where the human brain and, and what I'm going to say may sound like I'm being trying to be sarcastic or ironic. I'm not, there is a legitimate known point where people stop being able to adapt to new technology. And there is a point where that new tech just sounds too newfangled. And that's not how we did it in my day. And what do you do for the 62 year old who is saying, I would love to be able to jump into some of this stuff to be able to help myself in the future, but I'm a little put off by needing to know too much. Yeah. This tech has to be bulletproof. I mean, that's the, the bottom line It's like uh, the water example. Here's a water, the water heater we have, it works like a water heater. You plug it in, turn it on and it's got this big display on the front of it and you pick your temperature and it's done. But if you are a tech head, it has an app you can download and you can do all these configurations and do all this kind of crazy stuff if you want to kind of go a step further, but it's still operable and behaves like anybody would expect a water heater to behave like. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that's kind of what most of this tech has to be. It has to be, I don't want to call it idiot proof because it's, it's, that's not the problem here. It's yeah. People just don't have a desire to go that far. And things like smart homes are still not mainstream because there are so many rough edges and the user experience is like a death by a thousand cuts. And I've had a thousand cuts over this weekend. And this morning, my house smart home is completely blown up and I'm basically recreating it from scratch. But that's my of my own making. Like I made this hell that I'm currently in. <laughs> I didn't have to do this. But it's, it's one of those, the devices themselves that are in my house are working as intended and they will continue to work as intended. It's how I'm trying to glue them together and get them to talk to each other. That's breaking down. So it's the smart home tech and this new tech, like that I'm putting in my new house is should not be put, put people off of like, Oh, this is gonna be too much. It's, it's not, it really is not. When you look at the individual pieces, everything works exactly as is intended and it's, they're all rock solid. It's just a matter of when you start to glue them together. <laughs> Sometimes they want to peel back apart. <laughs> yeah. I'm suddenly uh, in my head two things. I envision somebody going with a water heater and plugging it in and immediately the water heater just stands up and grows arms and just starts smashing everything in the room. And the other thing is you're like an, you're like a t-shirt idea machine because oh, no. as you were talking oh, now <laughs> in a hell of my own making, that should be a t-shirt. Yes. Matt Farrell, October 9th, October 9th, <laughs> October 9th, 2023 will go down as a day of, of infamy for Matt Farrell fans. There was also this comment that caught my eye from Jay Mack who jumped in to ask a question, which I have actually considered, uh, Matt and I, when we were younger, we were tasked as teenagers with lawn care for the home. We would be responsible for the weekly, mowing of the yard and we lived in a house with a rather large yard and as a result i mean teenagers being teenagers and the yard being large can you imagine the levels of apathy that matt and i <laughs> and rolled things. around in in an attempt to not have to take care of this lawn and I used to joke that when I owned my own home I would macadam over the yard and would just have Black Blacktop. Top. I would open yeah. up a parking lot for, for my neighbors. I, not too surprisingly, live in Brooklyn, New York and have no yard. <laughs> but J-Mac jumps in with this question. One thing based on the Guy Show tangent, is a lawn the most efficient, sustainable, and ecologically sound thing to do with your yard? No judgment, just a question. I understand lawns are legally required in some areas. This is something that has been coming up in the news more often as there was mm -hmm. recently a homeowners association which was sued by one of the people who lived in the neighborhood because the homeowners association was forcing this individual to remove indigenous plants flowering plants that they were allowing to grow in their yard and they were doing this with the vision of 
it's more econo- ecologically friendly to this part of the country. And this is a place for butterflies and bees to come and find the things that they need to sustain themselves. And the homeowners association was trying to force them to no, cut it all down and put in grass. Yeah. It, the lawsuit uh, was won by the homeowner. They were able to break the power of the homeowners association because yes, you can't force somebody to grow grass if they are doing something which, which is ecologically actually within yeah. the place where they live. And you were talking about your home building and your yard care and lawn care. And it does raise some interesting questions, which is as we move forward into more and more ecologically and environmentally friendly mindsets regarding home ownership <laughs> is the death of the yard one of those things which would actually be a positive yes <laughs> big all caps yes uh, and having said that i have a lawn that we're trying to grow right now in my yard but it also depends on where you live um, like once the grass is growing it's fine it doesn't take extra effort where i live it's like i don't live in a, a drought area where i have to water my lawn every day it's like once the lawn is established i never will <laughs> I'll never do anything else with it other than just mow it occasionally. But it's it's one of those, we have to get over this mindset of what we've pictured as the 1950s cookie cutter house, which is that what that homeowners association is clearly trying to go for. Yeah. That's not necessarily what's right for every single area of the world. It's like you have to kind of evaluate what's appropriate for your region. It could be literally rocks. Uh, <laughs> if you live, you know I mean, there's in the that's Southwest, very, very yeah. popular yeah. in the Southwest. And it's beautiful. You can make it look great. You don't have to have grass. So it definitely, the idea of a yard has, I think, is currently evolving. I wouldn't say dying. It's evolving and it needs to. Yeah. From the Wayback Machine, I wanted to visit a comment from Matt's episode, Why Do American Homes Suck? (laughs) There was this comment from Fode who came in to say, you, my friend, haven't seen the Dutch homes yet. A three-year-old would make a better house than Dutch architects. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> In wow. our conversation about that episode, we actually talked about like some of the comparison across the board, like trying to look for apples to apples, oranges to oranges, and Matt's comparison countries for that episode was largely yep. England and Germany. It would be interesting to take a step back and really like break down Europe in a little more detail and also maybe break down the U S in a little more detail because the U S context is also very varied and a house being built in Florida probably has a lot of different expectations than a house being built in Maine. Oh, radically different. Yeah. That stuff is very different everywhere. But, but that one argument about that is like, if you're in the EU, there are at least regulations and guidance across the entire eu that create a baseline Mm -hmm. that does not exist here in the united states (laughs) so it's like even though perhaps in norway some of the houses are horribly designed um i would argue they're probably still better than here in the u.s (laughs) (laughs) that would be another interesting lens to look at which would be taking a country where home building and home cost are roughly comparable, but look for those places where they are worse. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be an interesting lens to look at. Yeah. Like finding that, finding that place where it's like, yeah, they, they could be doing even better than we are and aren't. So, yeah. And now on to our conversation on Matt's most recent episode, which is from October 3rd, 2023. Is a geothermal heat pump worth it? Question mark. My net zero home. The conversation on this one started with a comment from Orisberg, who came in to say, I live in Norway and installed a similar setup to yours back in 1999 and replaced the heat pump a few years back. There's one thing you didn't mention, the option of having in-floor radiant heating, which is basically hoses that in that are in the concrete floors cast into the foundation. It's not cheap, but the system was delivered with a 100-year warranty, so it's a long-term investment. 
there yeah. was a lot of conversation that spawned from his initial comment and a lot of back and forth with other commenters who were fascinated by the hundred year warranty. Talk about brilliant marketing by a company. Yeah. You put in a hundred year <laughs> warranty, the hundred year warranty. There were people who said I was on the fence until I saw the hundred year warranty. And then I bought in <laughs> if the company still exists, they look like, look at us. We've always stood by our products. If they right. fall flat on their face and go bankrupt, who are you going to complain to? There's no company exactly. anymore. It's, it's <laughs> absolutely brilliant. And it kind of underscores the stupidity of the 90 day warranty of most products that you buy in, in your home. Like, wow, they don't anticipate this lasting more than three months. Like the yeah. reality being yeah. nobody <laughs> making a product really truly believes in that product. Yeah. You get a one year warranty with this fan with a fan, like, Technology that has existed for more than a hundred years, you're not <laughs> willing motor, to say that this that can last. last decades. Yeah, it you don't think decades. your own fan is going to last long, <laughs> let alone like the AC, <laughs> the hot water heater. Like none of, we're not even talking about that level of tech. We're talking about a fan, and you don't think yeah. it's going to last more than a year. Here we are with a company saying like a hundred years. I wanted your thoughts basically on two things. First of all, like the idea of the hundred year warranty, but also your thoughts about the floor <laughs> heating system itself. I know there are reasons and we've talked about it briefly on the epi on previous episodes. Yeah. Like why you didn't go with the in floor heating. Well, the hundred year warranty, I find ridiculous. It's like that company is basically thrown down the gauntlet of like, we're going to be here in a hundred years, which seems like highly yeah. dubious yeah. but at least as long as they're in business they're basically saying they're going to stand behind that product which right. that's pretty impressive um as far as radiant heating it's huge it's like it's a great option it's incredibly it's like if you want to go the most efficient way to heat your home that's it would you the go would you go so far to say that radi radiant heating is hot right now oh it's so hot sean Sorry, and I couldn't help right. myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you couldn't. <laughs> the uh, the in floor heating though uh, is not the right fit for everybody. Like for for me, where we live, uh, like if you're in Norway, I highly doubt you have central air conditioning. But here where I live, you kind of need air conditioning in the summer because it gets brutally hot and humid yeah. here. So I needed two systems. So if I was going to do in floor heating, that meant I needed a separate air conditioning system for the house. And that didn't make sense to me. So I opted to go one tool that could do both, which was the uh, the air source, not the air source, but the forced air heating and cooling system. So one system could do both. That's why I went that route for the main reason. Um, second reason was in the in more efficient homes, like my house is so efficient and holds under the heat so well, the, the heating curve of radiant heat is like really like like a really low sine wave. And so by the time it hits its temperature, it needs to stop heating the house. It takes a while for it to stop heating the house. So that could create situations in my house where it could become a little overheated and uncomfortable a little bit because mm. the heating system and the house are both so efficient and take so long to stop heating that it could create a situation where it'd be uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I was told by my mechanical engineer that <laughs> some of the rooms, like our, we have a guest bathroom that technically has no air vent into it so there's no forced air conditioning or heat coming into the bathroom and i asked him about that and he said matt if you stood in that room close the door and you stood in there for five minutes your body will provide the heat the room needs to heat up that's mm. like how airtight that room and the house is wow so if you're thinking about an in-floor radiant heating it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense because you could very easily kind of like go too far so that also that was another reason why we didn't do it that sets up a really interesting image of people around the holidays huddling around the mat in order. <laughs> mm. It wasn't me. Specific. Who wants, <laughs> who wants cocoa? <laughs> there was this comment from Matt Schultz who jumped in the comments to say the D superheater concept is a fantastic way to save energy and cost when applied to kitchens. Commercial kitchens need a lot of usually un of usually conditioned airflow, which generates heat through a normal DX air conditioning unit. Most of that heat can be used to generate the hot water for food prep and dishwashing. Normally, a kitchen has a few gas water heaters, but more and more 
I am calling for energy recovery preheat with a gas tankless to manage final temperature. New tech is great. I'm wondering, Very have cool. you seen a lot of the tech that you talk about as far as home ownership? And you've also mm -hmm. had episodes where you talk about tech on a larger scale for commercial or just non-residential use because the tech just doesn't apply well to the home. Are you incorporating in your own home some of those that actually bridge both? Between you talking about commercial and residential, something of? that is a tech that is useful to the residents, but also has applications like this commenter mentions commercial kitchens. The idea of a D superheater in that situation makes perfect sense. So I'm wondering how much of the tech in your own home are you seeing as like, yes, this has residential and non-residential usage. Uh, well, th I, I have a video that I put out. What was it? almost a year ago, probably I visited a hotel. That's kind of a passive house certified hotel. And some of the tech that is in my house is in that building. So like it goes into that D superheater. They're doing heat recovery just like that. Um, I have a heat pump, uh, dryer, uh, for my clothes dryer and they had industrial sized heat pump dryers for their stuff because it uses so much less energy. Um, the battery storage system, like solar on the roof, <laughs> it's like all this kind of stuff. It goes everywhere from residential sized all the way up to commercial sized properties like Ikea buildings or hotels. It's like this stuff does scale up. There is tech that might make more financial sense in a commercial scale where it might not make financial sense at a residential scale because it's too small. Right. But by and large, most of the tech I've talked about in my house absolutely kind of crosses that divide for sure. It's interesting because from a certain, there's a certain point where when we've had conversations around like various battery forms, there are mm -hmm. those moments where you're like, well, this is a battery tech, which nobody's going to put in their garage. It's not right. It's not the right, it's not the right tech for the home. But a lot of the stuff that you are talking about, which are, they aren't even background things. They're not the things like, oh, I don't even think about the fact I've got iron studs in the wall. Like you're right. talking about your dryer, your hot water heater. Yep. You're talking about yep. the tech that you are actively using. I would think there's a certain amount of comfort you get from knowing that this is a technology which is not a one-off niche tech, but is becoming widely used even in commercial because when it's that uh, well used, you're going to have an easier time replacing, repairing, or finding various options that keep the prices down for you. Yeah, exactly. No, it's it, it. The more common it becomes, the better it is for all of us because of that reason itself. You get more people who know the tech, can repair the tech, more parts available. Uh, then there's also the, the track record of seeing that, oh, it's been in this hotel for the past 20 years. I'm putting it in my house. I'm going to be pretty comfortable with it. So there's a, a trust that comes with it. The final comment I wanted to share was this one from Spencer Ulridge, who wrote in to say, Matt, you are so right. Setting goals is the only way you can develop the correct yardstick by which to measure any system. This has been a really interesting series and very helpful to me as we plan our mountain home in North Carolina. Thank you so much for putting effort into your videos. Just we've talked about this before, like there's not one tool for every job. Yep. The, the, and you talked last time we, we spoke about this idea of setting a goal for yourself, thinking about what your goal is. I'm wondering, have you just instinctively landed in that kind of thinking? Or was there something you read or studied to help no. you better understand, like, how do I set goals for myself? How do I evaluate what I'm doing in whatever it is, building a new home, setting up a new business, like, this may not be a surprise to you, Sean, but like I was a user experience designer and UI designer for decades. And that's where it really comes from. It's like when you're designing a user experience for a piece of software for somebody to use, what is the goal of the user? What are they trying to achieve? And then you design the experience around that to make it as seamless and smooth as possible for them to achieve their goals with as few of those like little rough edges and cuts that happen along the way. That's the whole point. And so it's like when I was 
making these videos, designing this house, it all came down to the same thing of like, what are my goals? I have to know what my goals are. If I don't know what my goals are, I'm going to be buying tech I don't need. I'm going to be overspending money. It's, it's going to be a waste. And so it's something I always try to drill home in my videos when I'm talking about is solar panels, are solar panels worth it? I can't tell that for you. I don't know what your goals are. So you have to establish what your goals are. And to me, it's always really funny when I see in the comments of solar panels aren't worth it, bam, and they could drop, do some kind of mic drop as to why solar panels suck. And it's like, that's according to your beliefs and goals. That is not according to what I've, what my goals are. So it's like, it's a very personal decision as to why you want to do this stuff. Um, but yeah, it ties back to my, my career <laughs> before YouTube. It's, it's hitting me right now that it's very, I wonder if there's something there for you to look into and explore as far as teaching that aspect, right? To an audience of a skill set that you learned from doing. Does that kind of model exist for people who want to learn how to do that? Yeah, and if not, is that something that you could start to provide? I think it would be very it's useful. Like I'm, it's going to sound like I'm selling my course, but I have my Achieve Energy Security with Solar Guide that I, I, I put together and, I've, and I sell on my website. And one of the first things in the early chapters of that course is I teach it like, let's establish what your goals are. Let's figure out what your goals are. And I walk through that process a little bit. Um, but that is something I probably should do more explicitly. Um, that's yeah. an interesting idea for doing a video on the channel around yeah. some of this stuff. Cause yeah, that's goal muscle, setting. I think yeah. everybody has that muscle, but they just don't exercise it enough. So it's just a matter of kind of teaching people how to exercise that muscle. It's not only how to exercise that muscle, but to recognize that muscle even exists or that yeah. there's a, or there is a use case for it. I yeah. think a lot of times, and I know this from personal experience, uh, and it's, and it, I, I, maybe this conversation doesn't even make it into the video <laughs> who knows what the final edit will hold, but, uh, I'm fascinated by that because it is so the antithesis of my professional approach. And I'm talking about from my writing where yeah. for me, it is all about, well, you pour the water at the top and you see the path it takes. Yeah no effort like oh you follow the path and then it kind of gets stuck so you have to go back a few steps and reinvent it and like a lot of trial and error a lot of no goal other than i know generally where this story is supposed to go that is funny and it is and it is the antithesis of like sitting down and saying like i gotta hit a b and c how do i do that efficiently so for me my professional experience uh, has been one of a lot of trial and error and yeah. a lot of frustration. And I'm very curious about what you describe. And as you were describing it, thinking like, how would I apply that for myself, for my work? Like, yeah. is that something I could and should be doing? Would I find more efficiencies? Would I have a different response within myself to the angst of getting into the work and thinking, Oh yeah, I'm starting a chapter now where I don't know it's headed. I don't know where the end is. I don't know. Like, so I'm, I'm really fascinated by that idea of I that think, muscle, I think, that muscle that I think is you there. Do it, though. I think you do it though. I think you do it and you don't realize you're doing it. Cause like when you I have would that agree. goal, I would agree. Because like as, as a user experience designer, you're kind of taking a step forward and going, what's the ultimate goal that's trying to happen now? How can we guide that water to try to get there as smoothly as possible? Right. And then you design that system. And then you let users use it and then you watch them and go, oh, oh, they're not doing what I thought. The water kind of overflowed here and they found their own way over here. And it's like, okay, I have to redesign that section and figure out how we can kind of smooth that out. Because mm -hmm. what we thought was the best path wasn't the best path. So it's a little bit of, there's a lot of back and forth in mm -hmm. user experience design around that. And I think you're doing that when you're like, you probably have an over, uh, overarching goal of your storytelling. But then you do organically let it kind of or just go in that general direction. Yes. And, and I guess what I'm describing is you take two yeah. people to the top of a mountain and you put them on skis yeah. and the one person is like, I've thought about what skiing is at the bottom of the mountain. I've right. thought about okay. like, how do I, how do I control yeah. this? How do I like, if I turn my way this way, I will slow down. If I go this way, I will speed up. And the other person hasn't done that. 
both of them can make it to the bottom of the mountain. One of them will definitely make it to the bottom faster than the other one, but it might not be the one who wants to get down there quite that fast. And (laughs) so I think that there's, I think that there's the foresight and there's forethought. And and I think that a lot of people, and I'm talking about myself primarily now, accidentally conflate the two. Foresight and forethought are not necessarily the same. And that occurs to me in this moment of you describing what it means to be a goal setter. And so I'm, I'm, I go back again and you mentioned the course that you have and how that's a component of the course. Uh, I can't help but think, is there a course even separate from that of what does it mean to set goals? What is goal setting? How to do that? Very interesting. Very like just, uh, tangent there, but I hope that if that makes it into the video, I hope it's one that is interesting for our listeners and viewers. So jump to the comments and let us know what you thought about this conversation. Thank you as always for your comments. They do drive the content of this program and they also inform the content of Matt's program undecided with Matt Farrell, which is of course the mothership. If you'd like to support the show, please do leave a review wherever it was. You found this go back to YouTube, Google, Spotify, wherever it was, leave a review. Don't forget to subscribe and please do share it with your friends. That does really help support us. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can click join on YouTube or you can go to still tbd.fm, click the become a supporter button there. And it allows you to throw some coins at our heads, the welts heal. And then Matt and I get to the hard work of having a conversation. All of these are great ways to support us. We thank you so much for listening and watching and we'll talk to you next time.